hard pesian. Chinus MPL, see, Juliet Quaske, Uchinus Lamti, Horacia, Hes Quoske, took a quon suitin. In Isaiah McCryhu, Ruiz Quest, Chinim Scorupin, Exacles and Ho, Tusentakin, Uchiscalich. Jerry Ujerry, Ruin Pok Po, Lamlam's Pesian. Good afternoon, everyone. I am happy for today, and I am thankful for everything given from the Creator. My name is Ian Isaiah McCryhew, and I have lived 43 snows. I grew up in Butte, Montana. My parents are both named Jerry. Thank you, everyone, for having me today. Today I will be presenting my undergraduate student poster, and I've been blessed to work directly with Virgil Dupuy and the Salish Kootenai College Extension on this vital research. The goal of our research is to develop a herbicide prescription to reduce the abundance of flowering rush, the Butamus umbilatus, and also to stop its advancement downstream into the Columbia River Basin. So starting at the top left of the poster, we start with location. In northwest Montana, we find the flathead homelands of the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay people. The ancestors have lived in unison with these lands for centuries. But after being colonized and assimilated, the landscape changed forever. Homesteading and allotments had begun to unravel the agriculture that existed. And when the Montana Power Company built the dam, it totally shifted the full pole regime of Flathead Lake, altering lake levels and downstream floodplains forever. And that really contributes to flowering rushes establishing and dominating the local vegetation. Flowering rush is an invasive aquatic macrophyte. Its home range is Africa and Eurasia and was observed in Montana in Peaceful Bay on the western coast of Flathead Lake in 1964. And since then, flowering rush has become well established. It creeped through the dam to the lower Flathead River and Clark Fork Rivers. And now it's in Lake Ponderay, clear into Washington and Oregon, all the way to the McNary Dam. And so you can really see from our position in the Columbia River Basin, just how important controlling further downstream infestations really are. So just a little more about flowering rush. I mentioned that it is an invasive aquatic macrophyte. It also has two growth forms, both found in the flathead, compounding its control measures. The growth forms are emerged and fully submerged forms. The emerged is just like it sounds and, and it pops out of the water, but the submerged is a little less rigid, it's kind of more ribbon-like, and it can grow in deeper waters. So now we're really starting to see it dominate irrigation systems, wetlands, and the shorelines of our lakes and rivers. <clears throat> it's partially due to being so pre-adapted to our region, so it flourishes once introduced to aquatic systems in the Pacific Northwest. Flowering rush was intentionally brought to North America from Europe as a garden plant because of its humble-shaped inflorescence with its beautiful pink flowers. So flowering rush can spread quickly over long distances, traveling on the currents. It spreads when the root system is disturbed and it breaks off and it flows. A big reason to clean, drain, and dry is because we are seeing that boats transport flowering rush really easily. Some of the environmental impacts of flowering rush include threats to native fisheries that have considerable cultural importance to the indigenous people of the region. Habitat changes from open water systems to closed water systems are favoring invasive fish species. And there are major risks of alterations to the food web, which obviously affect our macroinvertebrates and our algae production. So not only do we have all of these impacts to native plants and animals, but flowering rush invasions also impact property values and recreation by degrading water quality, increasing sedimentation, and they definitely reduce irrigation water delivery. Not only that, they make swimming not very fun with the, uh, with the host of the swimmer's edge. So our research methods are listed next on the poster, and here's a picture of the study site. The study site was chosen because of Flowering Rush's establishment and the way it is already changing the ecosystem. You can see clearly, actually, from this Google Earth image that the light green is all open water, the way the bay used to look, and the dark green is Flowering Rush. Right up next to the fishing access in white on the, on the east side of that is the, is the fishing access for the bay, and you can see how dark and miserable that is to get a boat in the water. 
So Virgil established these five test blocks with three plots in each block, one being a control, a no spray, and the other treated with these aquatic herbicides, one being a mazapir, a habitat, and a mazamox, a clear cast. These were applied during the spring drawdown to bare ground in mid-April. So we have been repeating these, tra these treatments annually. But when I started, Virgil allowed me to dig a little deeper so we could see just how much control of the underground biomass that we were actually getting. So we designed a simple random sampling method for my senior thesis study. We did this by first building the core sampling tool to remove all the root and sprout biomass from all existing plots treated and controlled. I took six 6 inch by 10 inch core samples from each plot and I chose all of the sample points randomly. Samples were collected <laughs> before we sprayed each year, thankfully. I then bagged the core samples and brought them to campus. And then in the lab, I separated the above ground shoots and leaves. I washed out the sediment and I separated those from the below ground roots and, and the rhizomes. Then I weighed, totaled, and averaged them and classified them into three groups, the viable rhizomes, the root biomass, and the sprouts. I then took and planted these samples in the greenhouse, and I monitored them, monitored them for four months and harvested them again in August. I followed the same data collection so that I could compare those months. And while I was doing this, I started asking some questions. My initial hypothesis was I basically wanted to see how both herbicides affect the reproductive rhizomes of flowering rushes underground biomass, and has it reduced the potential of infestation. So if we continue to treat with herbicides, then we should see a substantial reduction in the population. So I threw this chart in here just because it's our annual sprout counts, and I felt like these really tell the story. Just take 2017, for example. 98% control for habitat and 92% for clear cast. That's a pretty good reduction in leaf sprouts counted, starting with over 3 million from the control. So then I asked several more specific testable questions. Questions like, is there a difference between imazapir treatments in April and August on the mean biomass of the rhizomes? And so I ran an ANOVA to compare the means of my samples and my standard deviation was quite high, it was 18 plus, and my p-value showed to be very statistically significant. Or I asked another question like, are the variances for imazapir equal in April and August? And to, de to determine this, I ran a two-sample f-test, which my f-value was higher than one, so I actually failed to reject the null on this one. So I have lots of results to report, but I'm still working on comparing all three years together. So this is why y'all see this empty space here. It's, it's not that I don't have results, but I'm still trying to figure out what my most valid results are, and I really wanted to be sure before I reported anything too definitive. So to kind of finish out and conclude with the discussion, we will start with some control measures around the marinas and boat docks this spring. We've been encouraging homeowners to get involved, we are using our story map as a resource for that. So you can see here is the link if you want to check this out. We are continuing our efforts and research to help the state of Montana recognize the importance of rapid response and not, not allowing more upstream establishment. In 2019, we actually we did report our sprout counts compared to the controls that were 19% for habitat and 30% for clear cows, which not too bad. So far, all of our statistical analysis confirms a similar pattern of herbicide reduction of rhizome reserves and leaf growth initiation has been observed each year. And the average leaf counts and rhizome weights in April and August suggest a consistent pattern of herbicide-induced reduction. In every treatment, habitat has, has been more effective than clear cast. So, in conclusion, here are some acknowledgements. This is not a full list by any means, but I would like to say thank you to everyone at the USDA NIFA for helping to fund this project. And of course, Lem Lumps to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai and Ponderay people for helping us protect their lands.
I'm Lance Pesciar, and thank you, everyone.